Okay. And apparently get one. Everything's on. <laughs> Dea. Dea. Right? Did I pronounce it right? Dea. 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 Okay. Our teacher's here. Just to let you know. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody told me. I don't know who, but somebody told me. Hello. Hi. <laughs> so many people. Are we the only ones here? Yeah. VIP. So I, I love think, this. So you I deserve think, it. Yeah. So I think we lost some people uh, to the other event. And also, it's later than it was last time. Last time it was 6.30 instead of 7.30. So I think that also made a difference. But that's OK. It's still going to be a really interesting. Oh, and we were able to do the live stream. Oh, hello, people at live stream. <laughs> um, yeah, which we couldn't do last time because of technical difficulties. So pretty excited that we are able to do that. Um, yeah. Yeah. And there, so the people that just came in, there's food over there in the back. So feel free to grab as much as you want. Um, Thank you. Thank you for the food. Of course. I'm going to strike your shirt. I guess we can do names because it's such a small group. We can do names. And what are you guys? Uh, what are you guys studying? And uh, why did you come here? Other than the fact that you got to miss class. I'd be curious and interested in entrepreneurship as well. Is that the class you're taking? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. I'm an yeah. international studies major. My name is Bisho, and I think international studies and entrepreneurship go really well together because um, international development is so linked to economic development. So I think that's where we can really make a difference. Cool. Yeah, they, just so you get a sense, so uh, most of the people here are signing. Oops, we lost your sound. Can you speak again just to... Oh, no. Oh, okay, hey, how's that? Yeah, yeah, that's better. <laughs> <laughs> that's better. Oh, is she hearing your uh, No, I don't know. She may just... Yeah, for some reason. To so my understanding, they're not shy. They're not shy, so they can stand up and explain. Who they are, so we'll just <laughs> <start talking. laughs> Hi, I'm Malik. Uh, and I'm at Gallaudet, I'm a freshman at Gallaudet University. And my major is communication studies. I'm taking this GSR 20 class. Taking a GSR 20 class. And maybe in the future I could become a principal and become an undergrad in public policy. Public administration. Become a grad at public administration. So right now I'm not exactly sure. Um, so figure so. it out now. <laughs> and you want to talk about the entrepreneurship too, right? You want to talk about entrepreneurship? What is he doesn't care about entrepreneurship. He doesn't care at all. Because <laughs> it's required. This is required. Because DSR. I don't really care. No, it's not true. But yeah, I'm not really interested. Right. I feel but like this is better. It'll be beneficial. Oh, good. Good. Hi there, everybody. My name is Anthony. I'm majoring in zoology. And I'm taking this class for so like money for, you know, get up an idea about how to start my own business and do entrepreneurship. Yeah. And also, it's a required class, teacher said. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Got to take this class. Hey there. <laughs> hey there, buddy. 
My name is Gilda. Gilata. Gilata. Thank you. Anyways, my name is Gilata, and I'm a senior. Yeah, you're a senior too. Yeah, anyways. So I'm taking this class because it's required, and I'm also changing my minor to business. Um, and I really want to see if I'm interested in it. Um, so it's kind of an exploratory experience for me. Here we go. Uh, Day, are you able to hear, by the way? I can hear. Oh. Sorry. Okay. I'm, I'm good. I, I have to pay attention <laughs> from, the, from the microphone, but, but otherwise it, it's clear. Good. So I'm like, we have a public administration, hopefully grad student eventually. We, you know, I heard about the, the zoology major, um, and I'm hearing about the idea of uh, thinking about uh, uh, learning a little more about entrepreneurship and starting a business. So I'm like, okay. Good, good. Does the interpreters have a microphone? Um, okay, this it's not very loud. No. Okay, we can try to get a microphone for next time. I am. Can you stop? And I'm majoring in communication studies, and I'm also thinking about business administration, risk management, and insurance. So maybe startups. Thinking about you know setting my own business someday. Oh, so I'm going to learn, and I'm open to possibilities. Yeah, that's the point. Yeah. Hey <laughs> there, my name is Joshua and I'm a junior. My major is business administration. Great. I'm interested in this event because I want to learn more about how it relates to business administration and facilitation. Um, because I think it will be important to learn how to deal with other people in society. Humanity. Perfect. Hey everybody, my name is Melissa Misho, but please call me Misho. I'm a senior at Gallaudet University and majoring in international studies. I am involved in international development and I'm very interested about that and I really believe that it's an important part about empowerment. If we work in business, entrepreneurship, we can really change the system. And so I'm really excited to come here and learn more about entrepreneurship. I'm Professor Tom Baldridge and I am their professor for their course. I'm offering this class as a general studies class. Um, so for people who are not only business majors, you know, it's a general studies course. So it will satisfy some people's required courses for general studies and core curriculum. But it's also to, you know, light the fire in them, light that passion and ignite that passion for entrepreneurship and business. Because I think it's something important to them. Whatever it is, you know, it can light that fire. International development is critical for society and I think it has a lot of potential and power if you do it correctly and it's a lot better than working in nonprofit. For profit can really change the world. So now we um, we are facing you know some assignments and they have to create some things and some products for our new Shakespearean uh, Exhibit our new exhibit at Gallaudet University. Um, at okay. Their portfolio. Their first folio. folio. First folio. Their first folio, and they are going to be performing an exhibit. Their first folio. They're going to be printing a play, and it was printed in six, 1963, 1623. 1623, after Shakespeare died. So it's a very historical book that they're going to be working on, and it will just represent Gallaudet and will be shown. It's a folio, a first folio in the library, and it will be presented at Gallaudet University. 
And oh, wow. Folger. At Folger L. That's a Folger. At the Folger Library. <coughs> here in Washington, D.C. is um, we're going to be donating, they're going to be donating and copying some of our first folio for their archives. Oh, wow. And Gallaudet will have one, of course, on exhibit. So they are going to be taking advantage of people going to Gallaudet University for that event. So it will be quite an experience. And when is this? October, all the whole month of October. Oh, wow. That's awesome. All the time. It doesn't it start um, on the 7th of the 28th? I thought it started. Well, I mean, you guys have to be thinking it. Think about it like a whole month of October. So, anyway, but the course is, you know, to inform the students about different perspectives about entrepreneurship, and it's very, it's a very critical part about, you know, finance. And this event is very critical for them to learn and understand about how do you finance through crowdfunding. Right. Well, I guess with that, we can get started. That was awesome. Thanks, <laughs> everyone, for introducing themselves. Um, so just to give a little bit of context, and I'll let Stephen also introduce himself. But my name is Diego. Um, I started an organization when I was actually in high school um, called Together International, and I um, worked on it ever since. And as you can see, I was born with cerebral palsy. And I was always really frustrated of how, hello, hello. Oh, more people, good. Why didn't you tell me? I've been <laughs> here. Why do you know I was here? I was over there. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna need to be more I think we lost a lot of people from the other event. So we're gonna need to be more specific on that. Uh, can somebody close the door? Thank you. Oh, I can just I would, but yeah, no, you're good. Close the door. Can you open the door? Sure. Oh, that's so much better. Um. <laughs> So, to recap, so yeah, so my name is Diego. I um, I work on Together International, which is a non for profit that focuses on uh, fostering community around disability um, worldwide. Because I was really frustrated of how society viewed disability, and to put this more in context, uh, I remember one time I went to a leadership um, group, and I fell down. And they had to call the doctors, and it was a whole scene and everything. And when the doctor um, got to me, he asked me, do you have any allergies or medical conditions? And I said, no, of course not. And then he looked at me really confused and um, said, why do you walk with a cane? And I said, oh, because I have cerebral palsy. And then he laughed, and he said, oh, that counts as a medical condition. I tell that story because to me, having cerebral palsy is not a medical condition and it's not something that I have to fix, it's not a sickness. Um, and so um, I'm really frustrated when people try to see it that way and label it that way. And for most disabilities, it is viewed like that. So I'm really interested in sort of seeing disability as a culture and as a community, much like the deaf culture. Um, and so, what we tried to do with Together International is try to get a group of young disabled people to care about a variety of things. And the issue that we're focusing on now, and I hope that the issue that sort of overtakes Together is that the idea of entrepreneurship and looking at entrepreneurship as a means for employment. Because unemployment is uh, very high in the disability community. It's actually the largest unemployed minority in the world. And so entrepreneurship can really be a a way in which disabled people can find um, meaningful employment and meaningful skills. 
And so that's why we're doing this meetups, and every month we're doing a different topic, and we're bringing in different experts and hoping to foster a community both for the disability community and for the non-disabled people to get to experience this and, and have this sort of experiences where there's a sign language interpreter and there we think about accessibility and all those things that you usually don't see in an entrepreneurship space. So that was kind of a long inter introduction. Steven, I don't know if you want to introduce yourself. Hi everyone, my name is Steve Rodriguez. I'm with the Global Entrepreneurship Network and I'm a community organizer here in DC. Um, I work for, I guess, Techstars. I help organize Startup Weekends. I also am organizing the next Startup Week coming up. Um, and I love doing this. Um, I come from a disability background and I love to see how I can merge my newfound interest in entrepreneurship and how do I combine that with disability, which I used to do in the past. So. Um, I love these types of things, and I hope to expose and bring more awareness of entrepreneurship to the rest of the community. Um, and luckily, I have amazing partners that help me do it. So, yeah. All right. Perfect, perfect. So I guess we can start with introductions from the both of you. Um, I'll let you start first, Dea. Day, sorry, I'm no. probably not pronouncing it correctly. <laughs> Sure. Uh, I'm not sure how much uh, information you're interested in, so I'll, I'll try to keep it super short then. So uh, my name is Daniel Mohammed, uh, and uh, in some ways I'm kind of I'm one of those people who tends to wear two hats. So uh, I, I had to admit there was interest in the public administration because actually my day job is with the U.S. Department of Labor, mm -hmm. and so I'm a policy advisor there. And so my my specialty is working on policy related issues, mm -hmm. and that's very much a lot of what my my daytime work is. However, outside of that, as far as personal interest stuff, one of the, the things where I take some of that disability and policy interest mm -hmm. is looking at, uh, is doing a, a film and, and, and writing and fiction. So I'm a published fiction author. Mm -hmm. My area my of interest there is specifically science fiction and fantasy. Um, and so my, my first book came out in 2014. I've had several short stories since then. And then I slowly started migrating into film. And um, and so for the purposes of, of today's thing, one of the toughest things about film is if you can't get in with the big studios, you, everybody talks about independent film, but the toughest thing for independent film is money. Right. And so, so what you're seeing now is a lot more independent filmmakers are actually going to crowdsourcing uh, as a way to actually make their, make their films. And some of these guys have been, have, actual fans and followers who've seen them do these smaller things and so they've been able to build on that and on that brand to actually create a business that's helping keep their studios alive and you see it also hitting some of the more big time with examples like um, uh, Veronica Mars which started out with mainstream uh, on mainstream television went off the air um, and when the creator went and said I want to make a film for this right. uh, it actually went went out on crowdfunding and was successfully crowdfunded that's great that's great and just for a little bit of context what is your disability uh, I'm visually impaired and I actually um, uh, have a traumatic brain injury and how if at all do you think your disability has influenced um, your journey both in the policy and the film industry? A, a, a little bit of both has been both positive and negative. Um, realistically, uh, you know, there's going to be all sorts of barriers just like you do in any other workplace. And the moment you go, a blind filmmaker, I'm like, no, 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 no. There, are, there are like a dozen of us out there. I'm only the latest one to go into it and to be able to use that. But, um, and so that, you know, uh, can be difficult. I've actually been very pleased, and this is where the positive part comes in, at least as far as the independent filmmaking community in Washington, D.C., most of them have actually been really open about it. I walked in and said, I want to make films, and most of them were like, okay, so how do we make this work? Mm -hmm. um, and they were very open about it. Um, and I'm a member with local women in film and video um, and D.C. filmmakers, and they've been, and we've been, have built some really good partnerships from that. And so when it, and I've worked on other people's projects, doing writing-based stuff. I've, I've done things like I'll hold the boom mic. If, you, if you're in there to help and do whatever, um, you tend to make those connections, which whether you have a disability or not doesn't make a difference. Right, right, right. Uh, and then you can be able to, to then use that to what I then said, I'm doing my own project. Uh, I want to do a documentary about the Invalid Corps, uh, a bunch of soldiers with disabilities during the Civil War. Um, 
I need help. Who's willing to come, you know, help join in on this project? And what happened is people answered and said, you know what, that sounds really great. You helped me on mine. Let me help you on your project. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and that, that actually works really well. And one of the, the biggest things that I'd probably say with regard to entrepreneurship, you can do a lot of projects and things on your own. Um, filmmaking is always collaborative. Entrepreneurship to do well has to be collaborative. You have to be the leader. You have to be able to persuade people to your vision. You have to be able to to build your own team. And if you can't do that, then then you can't really be a successful entrepreneur. You can be the solo guy who's doing his own thing, which is great. And and some people have done well. But but I think to really be successful, that's the next step. Right, 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 right. So and crowdfunding is a good test of that, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Perfect, perfect. And everyone, feel free to jump in if you have any other. I typically moderate, but if you have any questions or comments as we're having this conversation, feel free to jump in and interrupt. Because we want this to be a collaborative um, discussion, not just me <laughs> asking questions. But I think with that, we can go to Patty, and you can give us a little bit of your story and your background on crowdfunding. Um, thank you. So my name is Patty Simonton. Um, up until this past June, I ran the support team uh, for an online crowdfunding platform called Start Some Good, which was a platform specifically designed to support uh, change makers, for profits, social enterprises, nonprofits, uh, as well as individuals who were looking to make a positive impact in the world. Uh, since then, I've moved over to an organization called the Mentor Capital Network, where I'm currently their community manager there. Um, we work specifically with for-profit startup social enterprises um, from anywhere in the world. So I very much agree with you, Professor, that you know, while there is a place for nonprofits, in my mind and in the minds of many who are looking at industries like impact investing and social enterprise, uh, identifying those ways to make impact long-term is going to happen through for-profit uh, businesses. So development, entrepreneurship, that's it's very much where, where I focus. Um, so I have, I guess over the years, I've worked with, I guess, close to 250 uh, successful projects, helping them raise over $1.5 million in all projects of about five to $7,000, some bigger, some smaller. Um, so uh, when I kind of get into it, and I think we can both chat a little bit about what works with crowdfunding, what doesn't. Um, I know I can get into a little bit about why I think it's a great way to raise funds. It's by no means the only way to raise funds, but it really does offer a lot of opportunities. Um, my background is primarily in business administration. Um, I did do a stint actually at the Department of Labor <laughs> through one of my class <laughs> at the <laughs> at DOL. Um, and uh, yeah, so I've been in the service industry and um, uh, the crowdfunding and kind of just general management consulting kind of things. So that's more where my background lies. But if you can get into the specifics of crowdfunding, why do you think crowdfunding matters? What are the, the positives and negatives of crowdfunding? Yeah. That's I think that would be really interesting. Sure. And, I, I, I watched Tom speak a bunch yeah. of times, and he actually likes to say, like, what is it? Peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, like, it's very much peer-to-peer. -peer yeah, based. we tried to call it peer funding, <laughs> and we lost that battle. <laughs> so it's called crowdfunding. Um, but really, you know, and one of the important things to recognize about crowdfunding and what makes a successful one is that it's, it's it's about identifying your tribes and moving from the inside out. You want your friends and your family to support you because if they don't support you, everybody else won't. They won't have any reason to. They won't trust you. Um, so in my mind, you know, what are one, why is crowdfunding a good tool? A lot of it is that you can handle your own success. You know, you can be as successful as you need to be. You can work as hard as you want to work. You can start today with any idea that you want. There are many, many crowdfunding platforms out there. Um, they all have different uh, rules and regulations. Some are keep what you make, and some are uh, 
uh, an all or nothing level. For Start Some Good, there's the tipping point. Right. I saw that you guys had a great successful campaign yeah. not long ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. pretty exciting. Very exciting. Yeah, we've that, done two campaigns yeah. on Start Some Good. That's awesome. Both of them are really successful. It's called Start Some Good. Um, crowdfunding is also really a great way to be super transparent about your project. Um, you know, when you're raising money uh, through private donations, people may in some ways not really know how it's going to be used. Um, they may not know how many donors are participating. They may not have any idea of how much money has actually been raised. And while that can still be the case uh, for an organization that uses crowdfunding as well, a lot of it is. It's very public. People can comment right on the campaign page. They can question what the project is for, whether or not the implementation is going to work. Um, they can see when their friends have donated, right. which is extremely useful because when you realize that all of your friends really like a project, <laughs> you'll probably do it too. Right. Um, it's a great way to tell your story. Mm -hmm. It's a great way to share your passion for your project, um, to communicate why it is so important both for you to do it, but for it to happen in the community. Get people engaged, get people involved, and emotionally invested in what's happening. Um, it reaches globally, right, you know, right. in what you're doing. There's no limit to where the internet goes. And so even though you may not necessarily get money from people who are not directly benefiting from your project, you're spreading the word about what you're doing. So you're raising awareness. And when you raise awareness and you build your brand, then you build your community, and more and more people can feel as though they want to be part of what you're doing. And what are some of the limitations that you've seen through crowdfunding? There are mm. a lot, a lot, yeah. <laughs> a lot of crowdfunding <laughs> campaigns um, that are launched every day to break through that noise and to make your project relevant to anybody else is an incredibly difficult marketing hurdle right. to cover. Um, it can be tough to raise money. It can be tough to raise enough money to do what you want to do. Mm -hmm. um, so what I loved about the Start Some Good tipping point is that you would set your point at the amount of money you needed to raise to do your project. Right. And that was a way to build trust from your donors. Because say, for instance, you want to raise $20,000 to do a project. And you have to raise that $20,000 for your project to even have a chance of being successful. If you only raise $5,000, your donors may question what you did with that money. Because you can't do your project, but you have their money. So then they try to figure out whether or not you're doing what you say you're going to do. Right. Um, other challenges, it can take some time, quite a bit right. of time. But if you're doing a project, you're a startup, you're working your butt off anyway, right, so right. it's going to happen. Um, but yeah, a lot of social media, um, a lot of just telling your story and asking, which can be hard right. for people. Right, they right. Don't, people don't like to ask for money, right. <laughs> which is fine. But if you're starting a startup and you're trying to raise money for your project, you are the only person that can speak with that much passion to make it work. So you have to be willing to do it. Yeah, I think with that, you can tell us a little bit about your experience crowdfunding yeah. and what were some of the challenges and successes and how did you manage a team and sort of what did you have to put in place to be successful? Sure. Uh, and I guess the easy place to start with that. I agree 100% with what was said. Yeah. It is, it is mm -hmm. fully true. Um, and, uh, and Stephen as well. So you can pop in because Stephen was part of the team that helped make it happen. Um, so my project was um, was to actually get the funding to cover the pre-production for a short film uh, called The Invalid Corps and the Battle of Fort Stevens. Um, and it's actually, and uh, you can actually still find at least the records of it on, on Kickstarter. And I'd probably say the biggest thing, um, and this I think is probably one of those lovely advantages of crowdfunding, is that it makes you it forces you to actually make a plan. Or if you want to do it well, it forces you to make a plan. I think that's probably the, the biggest reason many, many um, uh, crowdfunding campaigns fail, 
was was people go, hey, this is great. You know, I've got 600 friends on Facebook. You know, each of them gave me a dollar. That would be that would be awesome. Each gave me ten dollars, and you get caught up in the fantasy. And the problem is that's that's not the way mm -hmm. it works. And it's it's really to say I have a great idea, um, right. but a great idea doesn't make a good business. Um, you know, and 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 so just like. The, you're forced to make a business plan. <laughs> Same thing is true for um, for crowdfunding. I think I started working on my plan, and and and, and this is where I go. I'm a lazy person. I will tell you, I'm a lazy person. I do not do lots of planning, and, and I took three months, and then I put out a, a call saying, "Hey, I'm looking for folks who can help with some of the planning and with some of the communications um, and outreach that would be related to this." And that took us another three months before we actually launched the Kickstarter. So. Um, and if we were to break down what happened in each of those phases, the first three months were, all right, um, can I write out and, and write out my plan? Can, what is the one sentence description um, of my project? I'm making a 10 minute film about uh, a, a number of, and I'm going to use the term, I use, use crippled soldiers who at the height of the Civil War um, protected Washington, D.C. And I'm like, one sentence, that was it. Um, you know, a paragraph of what it is. Who's with me on it? Um, uh, where do I think this will play? Uh, you know, what are what are and basically break down the pieces of it. And then the idea is, do I have a budget for this? And this isn't a. This might be nice or 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 that. Going all right. If I had to really get tight on this, this is how much it costs for a camera person. This is how much it costs to rent the camera. This is how much you're driving gas. And slowly just make out the entire list. Um, of what that is and have it ready and that's for doing it that's not for the kicks you know if that makes sense that's for doing it that same information you'll use over and over and over again you'll use it in the crowdfunding you'll use it in your emails when you um, when you send out notes to people saying hey here's this thing I'm working on uh, in your conversation so once you make that that information is something you will use all the time and it's something that you would then pass on to your team that they can use it. You'll see the same phrases showing up. Um, I spent a lot of the first three months going through Kickstarter keeps statistics. I love the fact that it keeps statistics. It'll tell you what months um, there have been the most successful campaigns, what months is giving tend to be the lowest, what months do most people tend to, to, to put things up. Uh, and I will say the the, uh, the best time to put, put out your uh, your crowdfunding campaign is when you're ready for it, um, but there's some some obvious things like July and August are terrible months. Um, wow. You know, one say summer holiday, uh -huh. but another reason when you look at the statistics shows July is when more people po put open up uh, campaigns than any other time. So not mm -hmm. only are there fewer people online actually donating, but also there are more people who have actually uh, opened up campaigns during July. So you're competing. Um, and that signal to noise uh, ratio that was mentioned right. earlier now becomes a big problem. Right. So um, those are those are kind of some of the, the the big things to start was to use those kinds of statistics and, and information to your advantage, making sure you have it planned. But um, the the biggest thing really is it is it is very much that kind of um, uh, that peer network. Um, and then I think what we ended up when we did our numbers is for every 10 people you connect with, one may give you money. No. Um, no. And so if you have 600 friends, then really what, you, you know, what you're looking at is maybe 60 people will give you money. Wow. Um, and so that's where the idea of encouraging people to, to, um, to share things, to spread the word, makes a difference. Because the more people, the, the more that outreach goes beyond um, your personal connections, the more people you have who can donate. Granted, the best money will come from those who know you best, um, but it, it is is kind of like doing your homework. It, it's why I can say, that, um, you know, plan when you're going to launch. Um, pick your reward tiers. Like one of the pieces of information is the most was it the the most used campaign level was the fifty dollar level at, at least as far as film is concerned. So most people will give about fifty bucks. More than that, the numbers go down. The best return on investment is the hundred dollar level. So, so when we start going, all right, when we tap one hundred, one hundred, sorry, yeah, 
um, and so when we planned our reward levels for crowdfunding, we knew that, okay, if mo most people are going to be at this level, then let's try to put our best stuff at that level and then uh, so, and try to make the $100 really good so we could nudge a few more people that way. Mm -hmm. um, and ours ended up with actually the $25 level being the highest with the $50 level being the second highest. Um, and so it's one of those things where I'm like, oh, we did our homework. It didn't quite work out the way we wanted to, but we nudged enough people into the higher brackets to get what we were looking at. And um, the I'm trying to put this in such an organized way, and it's coming out of my mouth and just all over the place. But uh, uh, like I said, I think do your homework, do your research, find out as much as you can. And this is where I go, I used Kickstarter because they had the most data on what they were doing. Um, and... Um, one of the things that I'd also seen was um, Stranger Pickup. Kickstarter, because of its high visibility, had a lot of people who just tended to wander around and go, oh, this looks like a neat project. Let me give it some money. Right. Uh, and um, I think I had about 17% of my intake with Stranger Pickup. I, I, I don't know who these people are. They <laughs> thought it was a project, and they donated money. So um, I, I can't complain. So, and um, so that actually uh, turned out to be a, a true uh, an accurate thing for me. And it was a, a risk because it's one of those all or nothing right. uh, uh, campaigns. And so that was kind of where the, the decision for that came, uh, came to was to pick, was it pick your platform um, to do your homework. And when you're ready, start, you know, start looking for people. And the other is the moment, the moment you put it up there, people are going to be like, what is this project? Who is that? Um, and if it's friends and somebody you know, they're, you know, they'll look at the Kickstarter page. Now the question is, do you have anything else to give them? And so one of the other projects that I did during the three months for setting that up was you set up a pretty web page. You set up an email address. And if you're doing this for entrepreneurship, you had better have that uh, already. And that includes a business page and a business site that shows who you are and what you are. Um, and I did a, a latest news. I had, I think it was... Um, I want to say almost 20 little blog posts showing all the, the different stages and ideas and information that we were collecting on the history related to that film right up until the Kickstarter started. Um, and then we added more information um, as we went. Um, and this is where I go during a campaign. You would better be on there and you better be answering every email. You better be sending notes out. I think, and when it comes to public notices, I think I sent out. Um, I, I wrote a public blog post that was something history, something catchy, or, hey, look, we made the staff pick, or, wow, look, we just got access to this great resource no one's ever seen in the world before, and you're a part of it. The, one of the, I, and I went back and looked just today. One of those went out every three days. Wow. So, um, and that was to make sure it, it stayed on people's minds. Yeah. Um, and I went back and looked. I said, out of... Um, we had 161 backers. Um, my original email list was somewhere like 800 people. Only two unsubscribed. So everyone worries about, I'm going to bother someone. I'm going to annoy them. Oh, they're going to hate me. So if I'm sending out notes, uh, and the emails weren't quite, uh, weren't every three days. I think those were about every five. So uh, in a 30-day campaign, I mean, that's like seven. I, you know, two people unsubscribed, that's it. So everyone else was fine with it. So I, I'd say don't be afraid to push the envelope a little bit. In today's modern era, people will say stop, or they will block you, or they will delete your emails. Um, you have to care about what you're doing enough to take people right to the edge where they're going to go stop. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Um, and I'm going to pause there because I, I think it's easier maybe to do this more as a Q&A because I'm like, I'll just keep going. <laughs> um, and I'd rather answer things that people might be very specifically looking right. for. Right. Patty, what has been your experience in terms of um, those type of things that they mentioned? I mean, it seems like you hit it right on the nail, but what are some of the mistakes maybe or the negative aspects that people do when they think of crowdfunding? Mm. Um, because, I mean, like, what is it, 90% of campaigns fail or something like that? No, I, the number is actually higher, no, lower than that. Oh, okay. so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Our, you know, to start some good success rates, like 54%, oh, that's pretty 56 good. Um, Kickstarter is at, like, 47%. Um, yeah, I think it's in the 40s. 
uh, Indiegogo, we put Kickstarter was how much? Like 47, 46. It's in the 40s. Um, Indiegogo, we, we used to put around 9, 10%. Um, they don't release their numbers publicly, so it's hard to do. And the difference between the all or nothing and the keep what you make also changes whether or not, right. you know, what they consider successful or not. Most people are more successful if it's an all or nothing model, right? Right, and the reason why is because when you have to reach that level, uh, your donors are incentivized to make that work. You have to reach it by that timeline or you lose everything. And so the people who love you and care for you and care about your project, they're going to do what they can to make that work. Um, All right. Um, I've got a question. So I really want to explain something because my students maybe, you know, um, you know, they're really getting, it's about basic functions and um, crowdfunding. And I think it's really important to think about what that is. Um, because we're kind of green to this field, and um, a lot of my students are just breaking into that. <coughs> so, explaining about crowdfunding. Mm -hmm. So, for example, my project, I'm asking for at least twenty thousand dollars. Let's say I'm asking for twenty thousand dollars. So, I tell people to donate twenty-five bucks, fifty bucks, a hundred bucks for my project. Suppose I earn. More than that twenty thousand dollars you guys pay me if I don't get enough donations if I don't meet the threshold then I get nothing that's the all-or-nothing thing we're talking about I, am I correct correct me if I'm wrong mm -hmm. so if I'm funding for my project and I ask for a thousand dollars you give me the money and I get up to that that threshold I can save it. That's not the all or nothing thing. So that's different. That's the difference between the crowdsourcing approach and the donation right. approach. Right. Mm, they're both donations. They're right, right. But but like if we're thinking for an example, like you know, like I'm not convincing people to give enough. So I've got like twenty twenty thousand dollars, right? Mm -hmm. And people will offer this, you know, or they don't have to pay back, right? Right, right. Um, so it's a keep what you make versus the the all or nothing level. Um, it's one of the common ways to, to differentiate that. And and I can speak a little bit because we've done actually both models. We've done all or nothing, and we've also done keep what you make. And I would highly encourage anyone who's thinking of doing crowdfunding to do an all or nothing because what happened is we had a forty thousand dollar campaign. We got up to like ten thousand or something. And in the and this was a keep what you made, and so we got ten thousand out of the forty that we were asking for, and the people that donated for the ten thousand were expecting a forty thousand dollar project. You know, they were expecting us to deliver that, and so I was in a bit in a little bit of a pickle because, you know, we we needed forty thousand and we only got ten, and yet the donors. We're still expecting their perks and their, you know, and the and the results. And so, um, I think uh, somebody used this example. If you're gonna buy, if you if your project is to buy a bus, if you need to buy a bus, uh, and you only get half the money to buy the bus, you can't buy half a bus. You have to buy the bus entirely. And so, um, a lot of people, especially in the nonprofit space, think, oh, it's better to get. Uh, keep what you make but I think it's actually not because it holds you accountable if you make that amount of money and if you don't if you don't make any money then you're not obligated to um, give the perks so you're so you're you know so you're free of that obligation of the perk situation all right and, and it's a risk that you have to take right. um, it sounds like it's safer to do this because at least you'll get some money. Right. But the idea is that some money isn't enough to build what you want to build. Right. Um, and, and let me just tell you, that desperation hit me hard enough that it makes you repel What was it yeah. like the last 48 hours? I got like 30% of what I needed. Yep. <laughs> it, it really makes people kind of... Uh, um, Push the push, push, push it to the edge. Now, um, I guess you can speak a little bit about this, Patty. Um, 
what is the ideal um, budget that you should be looking at? Because I think, you know, if you need a million dollars for your idea, probably crowdfunding is not the best place to go. <laughs> so so what, what would you say, especially for somebody that maybe hasn't crowdfunded before, it's it's kind of they're they're starting to think of entrepreneurship. What would you say is a goal that they should be striving for? There are many many factors to be considered for that. Right. Um, my first instinct is to say you raise what you need, um, and you ask for what you need to achieve your project. But yes. it doesn't need to be the bells and whistles version of your project. Right. It needs to be the beta version of your project. If you raise more than that, then you can move forward. Um, it also depends where you are in your project timeline. If you're just getting started and you're testing out an idea, crowdfunding is a great way to test an idea. Does your idea hold water? Do people care? Will they give you money? Will they buy your product? Right. You know, if, if you don't get anything, then you pull the idea, you rework it, and you relaunch. Right. Um, when it comes to a service or a one-off project, that's going to be a little different because it's harder um, to necessarily, it might be time dependent. Um, but how much to raise? I mean, raise raise what you need. I mean, mm. if you need $10,000, $30,000, ask for it. But be prepared to work to reach that. You know, don't right. just, and, you know, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, it's okay, and I'm going to add, I, I will say I have one slight, I guess it's not a caveat, it was a slightly different view, but I think it's still very much in the raise what you need, but I will say one thing that I did do, and this is why I'm, I'm big about homework and research, would be if you are building a product um, and, and, or something that, that's, a, that's an idea, there's nothing that stops you from hunting around and looking for projects similar to those to yours, finding out what are people asking for and what have they been successful at getting. Like, for, for making a short film, I found that most of them were getting funded between five and seven thousand dollars, and I set my number at seven thousand seven hundred and seventy-five because I thought that's what I could get. I could get the high end. We went over that is great, um, but I also worked my budget to bring my budget down to come close to that what they were doing um, because I think my original budget had about almost twelve thousand um, dollars. And so that is okay if I can cut it down and still make it good. And still fit within these other niches because I looked, and, and you can go back through Kickstarter and look at every kind of different short film that they made and, and see how much were people asking for and what were they getting. And I think checking other projects on on a variety of different platforms can help you find what are realistic numbers you could ask for. And the question then is, um, and this is where I go back to what you did say, which is, can you make it for that amount? And if so, then ask for for, for that and then try to, to fit it. But if it doesn't fit. Right. Ask for what you need. Now, I'm a big fan of crowdfunding because I think it gives you more than the money. It gives you the skill and the network that you can apply to other areas. Um, so I guess either of you can speak of what skills do you feel like you've gained or that people have gained through crowdfunding other than the skill of crowdfunding itself? You want to go? Yeah. Uh, sure. So what, what skills? So, do you feel like you can? Yeah. So the biggest probably was, and that's why I go the, the preparation route and the planning, because there was, there, the idea is I may have this wonderful, fancy idea, um, but but most people are like, oh, that's a great idea. Yay, we love it. Uh, you know, they'll push the like button, but to actually take people to that next step where they will give you their hard earned, like, dollars, you have to be able to give them something a little bit more. So the, part of it was, was doing the planning to be able to to give a compelling uh, and persuasive argument to get somebody to part with their money uh, for a project, right. you know. And and let's be honest, it, entrepreneurship just like anything else, there's a risk involved. So you're saying, give me money for this thing, trust me with it, you know. And it may fail, but even if it does, I want you to trust me with your money. Um, and that's that that takes that's not something you get a chance to practice. In everyday life, hi, give me money. Yeah. So, so yeah. this this actually was was kind of an interesting way to build that kind of persuasiveness, and that's what it is with your friends and people you know. But then, the, you know, as a part of crowdfunding, you should be reaching out to 
those who might have shared interest in it. Mine were like historical societies, veterans, groups. And these are people I don't know, who don't know me, I don't know them, and I've got to be able to say, trust me with your money. And I'm like, they'll trust you with their children before they'll trust you with their money. Uh, <laughs> right. um, some of the skills that I learned, so um, I've also had, um, I guess, three successful campaigns. Um, one of my side projects is uh, working with a local arts festival and coordinating that here in the city of participatory art. And we raised money for Figment. Um, and what the biggest challenge that we found really was, um, you know, on a personal level, was not having expectations that my friends would support my project. And recognizing that, you know, there will be, um, people have their own priorities for how they're going to spend their money. Right. And as much as you think like, oh, I know you and we're totally friends and I know I can count on you for a hundred bucks. Yeah, you have no <laughs> you know, so, and, and it's, you have to know that that's not personal, that people are okay, like, you can't, don't let it affect your friendships, right. <laughs> like, when it comes down to it. Um, <laughs> but really being willing to explore beyond, um, to test your idea, to, to accept that people might not like it. Rejection is really hard. It is hard when someone says no mm -hmm. to you. Um, and, you know, when you ask somebody, hey, will you give me money? And they say no. That's the worst thing they're going to say to you. They're not going to call you names. They're just not going to give you any money. <laughs> and then you ask the next person, and mm -hmm. that's okay. So really having faith in your project, having faith in yourself, um, and being willing to keep just going, for sure. Okay, so we have eight minutes. Wait, I, I, oh, sorry. Okay, Go ahead. I just have one, one other thing is, is if people don't give you money, give them an alternative. Uh, and so my big one was if, if you can't give me money, please share this and put this on, on Facebook. And I have one lovely, lovely gentleman who couldn't give me a dime, but I think he reposted my Kickstarter project at least once a day, every day, for almost the entire campaign. And I'm like, I, I know I have to have gotten money just because of how much he was posting that on Twitter. Yeah. Um, so, so, you know, if someone goes, oh, I can't, I'm like, it's okay, could you at least just help me spread the word? And people, it's a little easier for people to say yes to that. So if there are ways to get them to say yes to something else, get them to do that. That's great, that's great. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> I had one friend that once told me, if you want to prove yourself to someone, if, if you want money, if you want money from, from someone, um, ask for advice. Ask for advice. Yeah. If you want advice, you have to ask for money. It is so <laughs> true. It is so true. <laughs> so it's reverse it psychology. Right. 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 Okay. So we have technically, I mean, we can we have this room until nine, so we can stay a little longer. But technically, we have five minutes left. So, uh, does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, I got something. Um, <coughs> there, it's for the event. But, um, so, I like the way that you described your film project, and um, I like how you described it in one sentence. So, you said crippled soldiers um, in defending Washington D.C. during the Civil War, correct? Something like that. Yeah. And then that sentence was very impactful for me, for me personally. I was like, wow, okay. I'm really excited about this project. It sounds interesting. Yes. <laughs> so that thing about describing things, give them a hook. Give them a hook sentence that really gets them. And it's not easy to do that. It is not easy at all. And another thing, um, secondly, is how do you identify the best group? that will, you know, be willing and motivated to really give to the project mm -hmm. and donate. So those are the two things, that <coughs> sentence and then the giving. How do you identify that? Right. Do you want an answer for that? Or yeah. just <laughs> the, the thought for, I mean, what I would always tell the groups that I would work with um, is, you know, beyond your friends and family, beyond your core group, is figure out the people through all that noise that's out there and all the social media who cares about what you're doing who legitimately cares you know 
do people, you know, the project that, that you ran, you know, there's right. going to be people who care about disabilities, who care right. about entrepreneurship, who care about making that work right. for people. Um, you know, the Civil War, the film, you know, there, people may support a project for one reason or they'll support it because they love you or they'll support because it means something to them. You want to find that community and you need to ask them. You can't just put it in front of them and hope. You need to look them in the face and say, will you support me? Because when they're engaged and they believe in it, then you have them working for you. And then that's what you know, Dale was talking about. Then that circle expands. And then when people who are passionate about the project get to share it with other people who are passionate about that topic, then it just goes outward. So once you find that, it's a ripple effect. Does that answer right. your question? Yeah, because I, I talked about how we, think we made that sentence, but I'll be honest, it took going it over it again and again, and, and every so often you might change your word here or a word there. Um, and I still be, remember being in an elevator with a friend, um, um, and she knew this other person, and she's like, oh, yeah, Dave's doing this different. Dave, tell him about your project. You know, one minute, go. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, and, and there's no whoa, whoa. It was start talking about it. You have the length of the elevator ride. Um, and that that really and that really is the practice in doing it and um, and as for the the different groups I think part of it is when you design and make your project you should be thinking I mean it's good plan who is your audience who who are you making this for and then see if you can tease it out you know I'm like all right it's a civil war film about soldiers with disabilities so we know we're gonna get veterans groups we know we're gonna get um, uh, histor history and Civil War fans, and we know we're going to get dis uh, people with disabilities. Who else? Um, and actually sit down and think about it. I said, you know who our biggest supporters were? Reenactment groups. Mm -hmm. They loved it. Um, and, and actually, I've got a, a, a great, uh, just real quick short story here, that one of the, the best resources we got was a diary by a soldier, and the diary shows him uh, getting his disability, joining this invalid corps, helping protect Washington all the way to going home. And the book went out of print. And so we were trying to get permission to use it and the publisher didn't have it. And they, the family, the archive closed down and we ended up getting a private investigator to hunt down the descendants um, of this guy. Um, and so I got a hold of him, I think it's like his great, great granddaughter and said, hey, I want to use his story in this movie. And she goes, what a great, idea she goes they it had been published years ago as a soldier's diary she had never ever thought of it as a disability story and they're going to actually think about republishing it and using it um you know to help support and advertise the film as a disability history instead of just like a veteran's history so making people reframe their thoughts on, on things can be really powerful um and and so that's that's where finding some of those audiences and taking them your story um uh, can really actually help give you some big wins. And the nice thing is, um, right, that she let us use information from that book, which should have cost us a lot of money for free. So that, that, that was one of those nice things to be able to do. So I have a question based on what I'm facing now. So you talk to like hundreds of people, and if you're lucky, 60 to 100 donate, and you know, and you get, you get your project funded. How do you maintain those relationships once the people fund your project. I mean, one thing is to send them the perks, but maintaining those relationships and keeping them engaged, what uh, methods would you recommend? Yeah, I mean, Dave talked about her newsletter list that she had that people didn't unsubscribe, which right. is great, because you're keeping people up to date with your project. So and, you know, and everybody wants to feel they're a part of this. They didn't yeah. sign on just for the project. You know, they signed on to be a part of something. Right. And so always giving them that. I'm like, you know, oh, we were just here the other day, and this is what we found out. I'm just telling you first. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I get so many emails from projects that I've supported over the years. I really want to read them. I don't always, <laughs> but I appreciate that they're there, that they're still working on it, that I get photos and updates from their from their trips and their journeys, and it's uh, it's it's kind of neat to know that I was a part of all these great projects yeah, in some small great. way. That's great. That's great. I think that's a great uh, ending to this. So, did you have a question? Oh, oh, oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, I got a question. Um, 
Yeah, so I really appreciate your discussion and also the strategies you provided us. Some of my perspectives on this, um, based on some personal experience, um, working with the deaf community, it's very small, and you know, often a lot of people don't have like great sustainable income sources. So um, some people, their you know, expectations for crowdfunding um, in the community could be a little bit different. Um, and you know, like you know, obviously it's different with like the general population, but like you know, how do we crowdfund with that target population of deaf people? Um, and you know, not a lot of people don't have money, you know. So that's a little bit of a challenge when you're asking the dis disability community to support a disability initiative. Um, and how do you feel about that? You know, have you guys had the similar experiences? Because I've had faced that within the deaf community, asking other people that who are deaf and hard of hearing to fund and support something. All right, uh, this is Day. I, I, I actually uh, anticipated that to be an issue. The disability community as a whole isn't one necessarily that has a lot of funding. Um, but one of the things we talk about all the time um, within our community is the fact that disability issues uh, or deaf issues are not just internal to one community. They're, they're things that impact uh, people outside of that and so a part of me goes you know my 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 and this is very much a personal opinion here so I'll put that caveat is that um, at least when it comes to projects and business and things beyond that my expectation is that you are building um, and aiming a little more broadly than that and that's just um, kind of some of those practical purposes, especially when it comes to funding. If we believe this is is good for for the disability community, there's no reason it's not good for a broader community. So we see too many things have multiple uses, um, and, and I think to my own surprise in seeing some of the other groups that have also stepped up and had an interest in at the end of the day what is going to be a disability documentary. I mean, you you can't avoid that. It's about a bunch of, of, of disabled soldiers. Um, but have an interest in it uh, because they see it as something broader. So uh, I think that's my, my, my very firm belief. Other people may not always agree with that, but, but I would say that is looking at who, um, who all can and does have a say. Yeah, I, I second that. I mean, you know, you've got, yeah, thank you. Yeah. You've got the ability to connect and, you know, and maybe even bringing it full circle, we started tonight's conversation with discussion of collaboration and the importance of collaborating. And, you know, if you're concerned that the, the deaf community in particular is so small, you know, finding cheerleaders within the community um, who can then reach outside the community to then expand that message even more so. Um, you know, really, it does, it comes back to this. When you're collaborating, people feel engaged. When people feel engaged, they want to see you succeed. <coughs> And when they see you succeed, then everyone wins. So it's good. Right. Perfect. Does anyone have any other questions? Um, I got one back here. Just a question. Yeah. One. So um, I'm curious. Let me get up here. Um, I'm curious. Um, you guys agree with me, but like you know, I'm really interested in entrepreneurship, and um, I'm really um, passionate about like seeing how you guys kept your motivation, you know, through your personal experiences, you know, like. People can start something and you know like three months later that motivation can die so how do you maintain that motivation through the whole project and you know I've had some personal experience but I want to hear your guys' personal experience based on that maintaining the motivation <laughs> Wow that, that is a very good question um, it's really 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 hard I would say it's the hardest thing you're gonna encounter <laughs> Um, I've been working in the disability space and the entrepreneur entrepreneurship space um, since 2009, and I don't think we've reached the level of success that I would like or that I thought we would reach when I started. Uh, but it's something I can't think of doing anything else. I mean, it's the first time. I, it's the first thing I think about when I go to bed, and it's the first thing I think about when I wake up. So it's this like innate passion for wanting to bring the disability community together and really see it as an identity and as something to be proud of. And I think the real test of 
an entrepreneur is, are you willing to do this for as long as it takes? That's what you might answer. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I pride myself to sleep a few nights on trying to get right. this done. Right. Um, and and some of it is also just being upfront with with working to get things done. Um, I, I think motivation is tough. Uh, I think also part of it is also looking at it in another way, in that it's not just you you're motivating anymore. And then here's a little bit of the pressure. I'm like, for me, I'm like, you have 161 people who believe in you, who believed in you enough to open their wallets and say, okay. You know, I, I'm along for the ride, and so um, every time I start, you know, feeling that that I'm not doing enough, or I just don't feel like it, I go, I've got 161 people that I'm accountable to, right. uh, and that's that can be hard. And 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 to be honest, sometimes you aren't you aren't going to make it. Um, you know, like right now, I am behind schedule um, a little bit on our project, which is due at the end of November. So it's going to be like, all right, are we going to make it, or am I going to have to send a note to folks saying? hey, we're going to end up having to take a little bit longer to get this done and get it done well enough. And part of that is just the open, ongoing communication because that's it, it's a two-way street in that it's accountability to keep you on the road, but it's also motivation. Uh, I love bumping into someone. They're going, oh, my God, I loved your last update. I can't wait to see the film. And um, mm -hmm. and those are, those are the little reminders you hang on to. Right, right, right. Yeah. Um. So I, I might take a slightly different perspective. Um, yes, it's the it's the consistency and the persistence and the stubbornness that comes into it. Um, I think it's also an awareness of self and being willing to ask yourself really, really, really hard questions and being realistic. If your project is not working and you don't see like that passion isn't there, you're having doubt, it's okay to stop and try something else. It's okay to stop and rework it. It's okay to put the thing on hold and do it. At, uh, at Mentor Capital Network, once in a while, we'll work with projects, and when we provide the feedback that we do, um, it, can help, it can help projects die faster which means it frees up the emotional strength for that entrepreneur to then go do something else. So if you're, some people might argue it's kind of like having kids. I don't know this, I've heard this. <laughs> um, but that you, when you find the project you're gonna work on, you are so filled with passion for that success that you're gonna make it work. And you'll never lose that motivation because it's right for you and that's what you should be doing. And if it's not right for you, then yeah, maybe try something else. Yeah, and I think what you learn along the way, definitely I've learned this in the, but I, I, I've learned this in the past years, but I think I've started to reflect on it recently, that as an entrepreneur, you're, you're going to be okay. If you're crazy enough and creative <laughs> enough and, and driven enough to Did you say to, it's going to be okay? Yeah. You're going to be okay. You're going to be fine. Whatever you choose to do in life as an entrepreneur, you're going to be okay. So, so realizing that is a little free, you know, saying, I know that I have the personality, the skills, the, the drive to succeed in whatever I want. It may not be as quickly as I want. It may not be as easy as I want. But I have the, the, that spark that's going to allow me to succeed. And maybe it's it's not succeeding in the project you wanted, but if you need to make some money because you're going to you know, you're going to lose your home or whatever, right? You're going to make that happen and you have that ability to adapt and be creative and so so not downplaying that um, ability that you gain as an entrepreneur. Okay, well, I, I think we Thank can leave you. it there. Um, I don't know more questions or what we can do. I mean, we have the room to line, so what we can do is we can free up the room and people can mingle. And we have uh, little pamphlets with everyone's information in them. So feel free to take one. Feel free to talk amongst yourselves. Eat some food if there's still some food there. 
Thank you to both of the speakers. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Um, they had you stick you. around. That would be really great. But uh, sure, if not, that's fine. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thank you. Woo. Woo. Right. Happy hands. And we're clapping. Uh, <laughs> silent clapping. Uh, yeah. <laughs>